Cheringham, episode 42, In the Frame. Written by Matthew Costello and Neil Richards. Narrated by Neil Dudgeon. Chapter One Down by the River Sarah Edwards crossed the medieval bridge and gave a wave to one of the Buckland twins in the toll booth, but with the identical twin sisters always in matching clothes, which one was it? She never could tell. She then turned off the main road and headed down the rough track that led along the river past all the old barges. In winter, the track was a muddy nightmare, a challenge for her Toyota. But on this already warm June morning, the surface was hard and rutted. It was still early, and she saw the barges springing to life as she passed. Windows open, the smell of breakfast bacon in the air, radios playing news and music, and even the sound of hammering, the never-ending boat maintenance already underway on at least one old barge. The Thames itself looked metallic flowing with a brilliant sheen under a soft blue sky, just a couple of swans rippling the surface as if auditioning for a postcard. Ahead, she saw Jack Brennan sitting on the deck of the Grey Goose, mug of coffee in hand, his dog Riley at his feet, and his day pack all ready to go. Jack, in all these years she had known him, was never late, always early, always ready a habit she knew picked up from his twenty years as a cop in Brooklyn, as he explained when she'd first noticed it. He gave her a gentle wave as she parked next to the boat and got out. Got you some provisions, she said, taking out a couple of bags of shopping and carefully stepping onto the gangway, with some very nice-looking steaks buried in here somewhere. You are too good to me. Oh, you big time, said Jack, and she saw him put down his coffee, reach for his cane, and begin to push himself up off the chair. Here, let me help. I'm fine, really, she said, a hand on his shoulder. Then she slipped down the steps into the galley. I'll just store what needs to go in the fridge and freezer, leave the rest for you on the counter here to sort. She took a moment to look around the galley and saloon, all ship-shape, good to see. Since his long-awaited knee operation last month, Jack had politely refused all help apart from what she insisted upon. His stubbornness in that regard concerned her. She worried he wouldn't be able to cope. But so far, it seemed he must have found ways to improvise, hobbling around the boat on crutches at first and now using a metal walking stick. And don't you worry, she said, emerging back on deck in the sunshine. I'm keeping an eye on the tab. Think you'll owe me a dinner or two at the Spotted Pig? He laughed. (laughs) No problem, he said, standing slowly. And don't forget, I'm covering the gas for all these car rides too. No arguments, okay? Sarah laughed. (laughs) When would I ever argue with you, Jack Brennan? Oh, I seem to recall we've had our occasional differences of opinion, not that they lasted long. She waited while he stepped slowly across the deck to the wheelhouse and persuaded Riley down the steps. Sorry, old pal, he said. Another day cooped up, but Ray will be over, give you a good run later. I'll be back usual time. Riley seemed almost to nod at that. Sarah knew that Ray, who lived on the next boat, had a soft spot for Riley and took him on long, meandering walks. That is, when he finally surfaced to face the daylight. She waited while Jack gently shut the door, then turned to her. I took him for a short stroll down the towpath this morning, he said, slinging the pack over one shoulder and edging with his stick towards the gangway. How about that? Every day a bit better. A stroll, Jack, really, said Sarah, shaking her head and supporting him until they reached dry land. Doctors told you not to push things, didn't they? Oh, heck, I I can't just sit around waiting to get fit. Got a life to lead, knee or no knee. Yes, well, don't tempt fate saying things like that. You be careful. Give it time to heal. What are you this morning, my chauffeur or my physician? 
he said, then he grinned. Oh, don't worry, I'll stick to chauffeur, said Sarah. Must say you can be a tad grumpy. Me grumpy never, he said. I come on or we'll be late, and I hate being late, I know, said Sarah. She watched as Jack, definitely seeming to be improving, shuffled over to the car and got in the passenger side, but then struggled to get both his bad leg and the stick in place. She walked over and, with a smile, shut the door for him, then went round and climbed in. You still insisting on doing a three-point turn here? He said as she started up the engine. We'll end up in the river one day. Did I say a tad grumpy? I hope you won't be like this all the way to the manor. <laughs> Touché, he said. Then he turned to her and smiled. In my defense, your honor, damn leg kept me awake near all night. I forgive you, Jack. Now stick a CD in the player and let's enjoy this beautiful morning. And as the glorious sound of Mozart's fifth violin concerto filled the car, she drove back down the track heading for the countryside and Jack Brennan's new part-time job, designed to give him something to do while he recuperated. While Sarah drove, Jack sat back and concentrated on bending and stretching his leg. It was a month since the operation to fix his knee, which he knew he should have had done years ago, and only now was the pain finally beginning to subside. Since the op, he'd stayed off the potent painkillers. Too many times he'd heard from friends back home about how those damn pills could just take over your life. But it wasn't the pain that had bothered him most, it was the boredom. Just sitting with Riley on the deck of the goose, watching the world go by. Oh, sure, he loved catching up on his reading, but a long day was a long day. So when Will Goodchild had called him from the Cheringham Historical Society and said he'd heard they were looking for a volunteer steward for a few weeks at Morton Manor, just a couple of miles downriver from the village, he'd said yes immediately. The whole thing had fallen into place quickly. An interview with Justin Forbes, the manager of the historic house, which Jack knew he'd sailed through, then Sarah had offered to drive him there and back morning and evening, and just a couple of days later he'd been installed in the great hall of the magnificent old manor, sitting in a nice comfy chair, chatting to visitors about the house, its history and its artefacts, all of which totally fascinated him. It was perfect. Two weeks into the job and he was already considering making it permanent, though with the clause allowing him the freedom to join Sarah in their little uh, investigations whenever they might arise. You still enjoying being a steward, Jack? said Sarah. Wow, let's add mind reader to your list of skills, he said. Was just thinking I might stick with it for a while. Interesting. Think Will knew it would be right up your alley. What are the other people like? Or oh, the other stewards? Uh, <laughs> how long you got? Let's just say they're a, a curious bunch. I can imagine, said Sarah, laughing. It's really the visitors who make it worthwhile. The questions they have, what interests them, all of that. So good. I bet it's perfect for you, meeting people all day long, talking history. Maybe you should do a history degree, too. Are you kidding? Somehow don't see myself sitting with a bunch of undergrads. Why not? Jack looked out of the window at the fields and woods rolling by. He'd never thought of himself as the academic type, though he did, as a step towards his detective shield, get a degree in criminology from Brooklyn College. But that was decades ago. Only real history I ever did was cold cases, he said. You think there's a university desperate enough to let me in? I'd bet you now know more about Cheringham's past than most of the members of the Historical Society. Hmm, well, I doubt that. Some pretty sharp cookies in that lot. Though I do hold up pretty well, thought Jack. Anyway, here we are, said Sarah, turning off the road and through the tall pillared gates of Morton Manor. As they passed the gatehouse where the young handyman lived, Jack noticed that the lights were still on, which seemed odd on such a bright morning. They carried on into the estate grounds with grand rolling lawns on either side, and just ahead on a small rise the imposing mansion that was Morton Manor. I tell you, never tire of this view, he said as they sped down the drive. Absolutely classic. Then he noticed something else not quite right. Funny, he said. The visitor's car park gates are still padlocked. Is that somebody's job to open up? Yeah, a nice old fellow called Cyril Roebuck, a steward. Uh, been doing it for years, snow, rain, or shine. I guess everyone misses a day eventually, said Sarah. But then Jack saw that the wooden sandwich board sign that usually stood at the side of the drive informing visitors where to park had also not been pulled.